Hello, I'm Paul Pirello and welcome to the Philly Factor. Boathouse Row is an iconic part of the landscape of the city of Philadelphia. Tucked away on the banks of the Schuylkill River, many of us pass it on our way to work or school. Perhaps if you're a visitor to the city, you see it lit up at night. Uh, but yet, how many people really know about the history of Boathouse Row? Well, my guest here on this edition of the Philly Factor knows Boathouse Row perhaps uh, intimately inside and out, not only because she has written a book titled appropriately Boathouse Row, but she herself, Dottie Brown, is also a uh, rower. And Dottie, I want to thank you for being here uh, on our program. And you have done a wonderful job um, sort of capturing this iconic landscape along the banks of the uh, Schuylkill River. So congratulations on the book. And I know you put a lot of time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears, as they say, into this book. You told me right before we went on the air, uh, three years from start to finish, uh, not only writing the book, but acquiring all the photos that we're going to see some uh, of those photos as we move through the, um, uh, the show here. So what made you decide to write a book on Boathouse Row? Well, actually, it was not my idea. Uh, an editor at Temple Press came to me with the idea. I have to give him credit. And he came to me because my background as a journalist for a long time in Philadelphia, working for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and also because I rode. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to think very hard about whether I wanted to spend that kind of time on a, on a book, mm -hmm. um, and especially a book about rowing, where while I enjoyed the sport, I didn't want to write a book about sort of the mechanics of rowing or all the races involved in rowing. Um, once I started researching, though, I discovered these fabulous stories in, buried in old minute books that are stored in, in boathouses at the library company, other historical archives that we have in Philadelphia. And I was just fascinated. So after a couple months of preliminary research, I decided, yes, I could write a book like this. Yeah, and, and most of us are familiar with Boathouse Road simply because we probably pass it either on uh, the Schuylkill Expressway, and at night it is very pretty, or the early morning hours, mm -hmm. like some of us go to work and it's still dark out, it is very pretty when it is all lit up. Uh, or if you're on the Kelly Drive or the Martin Luther King Drive, we see these iconic houses there on the banks of the river. But um, what your book has done is really has given us the backstory to these more than a dozen buildings along um, uh, the Kelly Drive, which was referred to as East River Drive for a long time too, and we'll get into that connection here in a moment. But um, I think you would agree that a lot of people are familiar with these structures, but don't really know the history of what these buildings mean to the rowing community, not only here in Philadelphia, but I think worldwide. That's right, yeah. yeah. They uh, were built starting in uh, 1860, after the city of Philadelphia ordered all the shacks that had been built along the river torn down. It was about the same time that Fairmount Park was being developed and the city wanted uh, more permanent kinds of structures along the river. Uh, it was a very popular sport, or it was becoming a very popular sport, and young men who had some leisure time were putting up these shacks to house their, their boats. So in 1860, um, you had the first um, boathouse uh, that was put up. It was uh, actually called the Skating Club because the weather, winter was so cold that people would skate, tens of thousands of people would skate on the Schuylkill really? in, those, in those years, wow. yeah. And the members of the skating club would be out there rescuing them if they fell through the ice. Mm. Um, but in the summer, it was a boathouse. Uh, and uh, slowly the boathouses were built. Uh, in 1867, um, uh, the Fairmount Park Commission, which by then had just started, uh, decided that they had to not only be made of stone, but they had to be picturesque. Um, they had to match the beauty they were envisioning for Fairmount Park, which was growing at the same time as Central Park in New York. Mm -hmm. And so um, these houses started to, to be built. And eventually, um, you had uh, uh, Undine uh, come up, um, which was the boathouse built by Frank Furness, one of Philadelphia's great architects of the 19th century. He's noted today mostly for the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts mm. is one of his buildings. And he had a tremendous influence on the row and the architecture of it as it evolved. Yeah, uh, one of the first pictures that we just showed here was uh, of that uh, first uh, uh, house that went up and uh, the sign out there, there it is right there. Uh, um, that today is, um, 
it's still standing, but um, you also mentioned women because this was predominantly a male sport, and yet this was a, uh, a house that oh, today is for uh, primarily a, a female or a women's rowing house? Yes, it is today, but that only happened in 1938 mm -hmm. when a group of secretaries and clerks learned that the skating club was moving to Ardmore where it is today. Right, right. And uh, when it became available, they quickly uh, were able to lease it before the men found out. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just predominantly men, it was all men until then. Okay. Um, you also, um, uh, you know, when we talk about rowing on the Schuylkill River and, you know, but rowing was a sport that goes back to the early 1800s, 1815, I think you document in the book that, you know, there would be migration of people uh, out to the Schuylkill River to watch what were then rowing competitions or regattas on the river. So when we think of rowing sport, it really is a sport that goes back to the early 1800s. Yeah, it actually goes back in Europe, to, you know, to well before then, mm -hmm. but it has evolved uh, as the boats got lighter and, uh, and competition got fiercer and uh, technology got better with seats that slide as opposed to fixed seats. They used to grease the bottom of their pants to slide on the really? seat to get more power out of their legs. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it was a huge spectator sport in the uh, 1870s, 80s. Uh, it was the biggest spectator sport. It was basketball was not yet uh, there. Mm -hmm. uh, baseball was just starting. Football was just starting, and nobody had a television. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so they came down to the river. Yeah, for sure. And today, even the Schuylkill River um, is still known for uh, for rowing competitions. We uh, talked before the show that in the uh, in the spring we have uh, the Dadvale Regatta in Stokesbury, and then there's also another one coming up at the uh, at the end of this month, the month of October. And, uh, but as opposed to Stokesbury and Dad Vale, which is primarily collegiate rowing uh, competition, uh, college rowing, mm -hmm. uh, the one that's coming up, and uh, you can mention the name here, is a, a public uh, rowing competition, correct? Yeah, it's the he head of the Schuylkill. There's one in Boston called the head of the Charles. Um, there are two huge races where anybody can race. Mm -hmm. um, and it's masters rowers, women, men, high school kids, college kids, and they come from up and down the East Coast and further t to race here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you race in your age, age and uh, gender category. Mm -hmm. So these homes, and we're talking about a dozen structures, a little more than a dozen of these homes that grace the, um, the banks of the Schuylkill River on what is now the Kelly Drive, but was for the longest time known as the East River Drive. Um, are these homes independently owned? Are they part of the Fairmount Park Commission? Does the city own them? So give us the lay of the land here. Uh, these homes, who do they belong to? Okay, the houses are owned by the clubs. Um, and they sit on land that belongs to the city, okay. to Fairmont Park. Um, this is a long-standing arrangement that goes back, you know, into the 19th century. Um, the houses are maintained entirely by the clubs. Uh, and it's no small feet to be able to do that. They are very, very old. They require a huge amount of maintenance. They've had many renovations uh, and the clubs get no uh, city funds for that. They do that all themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, membership is not much more or about the same as a, or even cheaper than many gym clubs. It's about $500 a year to belong to a club and if you learn how to row, you can join one. Yeah, uh, we saw a photo here. I think it was the University of Pennsylvania uh, uh, so when we talk about the, the, some of these homes look the same today as they did back then, and, and give us an idea of what we're looking at here. Well, this one doesn't look at all like it looks today. This is the University of Pennsylvania uh, Club, which is called actually the College Boathouse, and it, this is a photo from 1904. It was built in the 1870s, and um, Fairmount Park, when they gave permission for the houses to be built, created beautiful spaces between them. So you can see in this photo the nice space between this club and the one next to it. Mm -hmm. um, there's been sprawl since then mm -hmm. um, because the, the boats got longer. Uh, they used to be six oared, then now they be, they're eight oared boats with eight seats and a coxswain, so they had to push out the back of the houses. Uh, women joined and they needed more space, so there's been sideways sprawl. So if you stand and look at these houses today, you, 
you'll see, if you look carefully, the old original structure on some of them. Uh, the Penn Boat House has a lot of red on it, so you mm -hmm. can notice it from um, the other side of the river, and you can see just a little bit left of what you saw in that picture. How about that? Uh, the other thing that I want to mention here is that um, the last building to go up on Boathouse Row, uh, by contemporary standards, was a few decades ago, and that was Lloyd Hall that was built. That was the last building to go up on Bo Boathouse Row? Well, I would say that in 1904, Fairmount, which is the building next to Lloyd Hall, was really the last boathouse to be built. Okay. Uh, Lloyd Hall replaced a public boathouse, um, but it is not a boathouse today. It's not? It's, no, it is a uh, place that has a, cafe, a cafe and it has public spaces with a big basketball court and other uh, uses in that building for the public, but it has no, uh, there's no boathouse there. Okay. Um, the city is exploring how to once again have a public boathouse as some other cities have. Are there are any plans or, or uh, anything on the drawing board where they might expand the number of homes on Boathouse Row? Let's say there's a, a school or, uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the need for or desire for a public boathouse. I mean, could they, or is there something written into the law that says you cannot expand beyond these structures that are there on Boathouse Row? Well, between Lloyd Hall and number 15, which is uh, a house called Sedgley, which also is a, a women's social club, it's not a, it's where the lighthouse is. Yeah. It's not um, a rowing club either. There is no space. Um, and other houses have been built upriver. Uh, St. Joe's has its house. Um, Temple University is now rebuilding its house. But the real growth uh, in terms of d the greater demand for rowing facilities from a lot of high schools and colleges in the area is up at Cachahocken. Really? So mm -hmm. there's a whole stretch of, uh, of rowing up there that's now happened and a lot of the suburban schools are rowing up there. I yeah. want to bring up a photo, uh, a name that is synonymous with the city of Philadelphia and that is John Kelly. Um, right before we went on the air, there are three John Kellys, but this was um, one of the first John Kellys. I mean, this is the father of Princess Grace? Or yes. Is it, it is, okay. Yes, this is the uh, the father of Princess Grace, John B. Kelly Sr., who was uh, one of the greatest rowers the world had ever seen. And he, in 1920, he won a gold medal uh, at the Olympics in a single. And then within an hour, he turned around and won another gold in a double. Mm. Uh, and he was hailed as a fabulous rower. And in 1924, he won another gold medal in a double. Um, and he... Um, he spent a lot of, put a lot of his energy into making sure that great rowers would be on Boathouse Row. And he encouraged kids in Catholic high schools because he himself was Irish Catholic and he thought these are the kids who know how to work hard, as he did. Mm -hmm. uh, he encouraged them to row and there were kids from West Philadelphia uh, Catholic School for Boys, uh, Roman Catholic, uh, there was uh, North Catholic. All were brought into his boathouse to train to row, and they became one of the great rowing teams of the 1930s, early 1930s. Uh, and then, because of them, LaSalle, for one, and other, uh, particularly Catholic colleges, uh, started rowing in the 1940s. Uh, so John B. Kelly really is very important to rowing in Philadelphia, and his statue is on Kelly Drive, um, up by the reviewing stands. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Kelly Drive is named for his son. Correct. Uh, so he wanted his son, John B. Kelly Jr., to uh, win a very important race in England at Henley. Uh, the, it's called the Diamond Single, uh, Diamond Challenge Skulls, and it's the greatest single competition in the in the world, or at least Kelly felt that way. More important even than the Olympics, and he was not allowed to row there because presumably. He'd worked with his hands, and it violated the amateur rowing rules that England had at the time. The story is really more complicated than that, but it's in the book. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, his son became a fabulous rower as well, and mm -hmm. won all kinds of things. Um, and then his son, uh, John B. Kelly III, uh, is very involved with Boathouse Row today. He's a member of the Vesper Boat Club, My Boat Club. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, when we talk about the women's role in the sport as well as Boathouse Row. Another photo that we're going to show here is uh, this woman who is? Ernestine Bayer. 
uh, Ernestine Bayer was among those women I mentioned earlier who realized that the uh, Philadelphia Skating Club was available. She had married secretly, she had eloped in 1928, in January of 1928, with Ernest Bayer, um, who was uh, training for the Olympics. And they did not want to reveal uh, their marriage because at the time it was believed, hard to believe now, that being married would affect a man's strength. Mm -hmm. um, so they were afraid he would not be allowed to row in the Olympics if their marriage was known. So they announced it in September of that year after he won a silver medal mm -hmm. at the Olympics. She later went on to build the Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club into the first continually competitive rowing club, girls rowing, women's rowing club in the United States. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and we talk about the contributions of, of these people that we just talked about here, but there are, I mean, there are stories uh, about rowers that uh, homegrown talent as well as, you know, um, uh, national and international um, rowing competitors that come here, uh, whether it's to take a, a ride on the river or to compete in one of the races, uh, Philadelphia really is a mecca uh, for, for rowing. Uh, and, and why is it? Is it, is it because uh, the you know the Schuylkill River is one of I mean you know you're, you're a rower uh, why do people come to Philadelphia why have we become this mecca for rowing well there are a couple of reasons first of all we do have a wonderful stretch of river uh, which we can thank the dam that was built in 1921 mm -hmm. for calming the river so that's one but it's mostly I think our history uh, it's our history and and the continual effort of the clubs to um, support competitive rowing. Uh, we have Olympians, some who uh, competed in, in Rio just mm -hmm. now, trained here uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, the clubs support elite rowers who don't have the, you know, the money to, they, they, don't, they can't both work and train. Sure. So they, they get support from money raised by the clubs. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a lot of things. Uh, the history, the beauty of it, we are, the place where um, amateur rules were first written for any sport in the United States, and that happened here in Philadelphia in 1858. So um, it's all intertwined with uh, culture, history, and yeah. And, and yet, um, I, I know, and, and, and not to get too much into the business of, of rowing or how decisions are made, whether to have a competition here or not, but a few years ago, the city of Philadelphia was on the you know was teetering on the brink of losing one of these bigger regattas and moving it across you know to Jersey and you also mentioned that uh, you know up in the Conshohocken area now there you know um, you're seeing activity with rowing clubs locating there um, but uh, you know is the Schuylkill uh, any different up in the Conshohocken area is the course different there than it is downstream here and you know in the city it is narrower it is it is narrower so it's not as good you can't easily, you can't get six boats across uh, in, in lanes like you can for the stretch of, of competition that we have here. Mm -hmm. So give me an idea then for the, like the boating clubs, like you mentioned you're a member of the Vesper, right, of the Vesper Club. So, um, you know, um, all, um, anybody that I've met and they talk about the sport of rowing, they're so passionate about the sport. And I guess, you know, equally as passionate about making sure and maintaining that rowing, whether it's boathouse row and or you know, or, or just the sport is is maintained. The integrity of it is maintained, and that's why and, you know I said it before we started here. Your book is such a, a great testimonial to the sport as well as to the iconic landscape that's Boathouse Row, and and I get that because of the passionate of of, of talking to many rowers, uh, because I mean you know you can be passionate about baseball, but if your team's losing, you'd still be passionate, but you know you're you're sort of angry at the team because of whatever, but. Rowers are just, I mean, inside and out passionate about this sport. Yes, it's physically a very challenging sport, especially if you're competing. Uh, it, it uses every muscle in your body and you, um, your oxygen is, it gets depleted and your mus muscles scream out. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I have never gotten to that point because I don't really race. I, sure. I'm out there enjoying the turtles and the cormorants and the seagulls that come through in the fall and it's very beautiful out on the river um, but I think the passion for rowing really is in part life-changing that people who take it seriously report that they are it changes their lives they learn discipline uh, they learn all kinds of skills teams 
skills. If you're in a boat with eight people, everybody has to row exactly at the same time to make it go. Mm -hmm. um, your ego can't be like hyped up. Um, and um, it's just, it's the, it's the reason that Philadelphia City Rowing uh, started. It's a nonprofit aimed at at youth city public school kids who don't have rowing clubs themselves. And it's a way to get them to the river, give them academic support, and give them the kind of uh, training and support that will last them their whole lives in other, in other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a scene, uh, there's a photo right there of, uh, of that program that you're talking about, uh, giving um, um, kids uh, from all walks of life the opportunity to get uh, into um, a skull, is that, am I, am I correct? Yeah, uh, right. And, and, uh, and try their hand at, at rowing, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there's another photo I want to bring up here too of the LaSalle College High School um, boys, I believe, there you go, uh, on the Schuylkill River. And uh, again, you know, another uh, great organization, um, uh, high school organization, uh, aimed at um, uh, mentoring and and fine-tuning uh, the, these athletes uh, in, when it comes to rowing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They were one of the first high school rowing programs in Philadelphia. Well, how about yeah. that? This other photo that I'm going to put up there is, I think, a photo that we always uh, come to think of Boathouse Row. And I know um, that's Boathouse Row at night or at, uh, right before the sun is setting, uh, I'm guessing. Um, I mean, it's one of those iconic images that we all know. But when they went to put the lights on, road, uh, on Boathouse Row, um, I guess some of the purists felt that, uh, you know, were, was that going to um, change the integrity of Boathouse Row? But it really has made, I mean, talk about lighting up an iconic structure. So uh, what was the mindset behind putting the lights on Boathouse Row? So there was an architectural a lighting architect, uh, Ray Grinald, who had this idea. And what he told me was that whenever he went to around the world, um, the only picture he would see of Philadelphia was basically the Liberty Bell, and mm -hmm. he thought that was rather boring. And we had these wonderful um, places like Boathouse Row that could be lit up, and he wanted that to be the poster that people saw when they saw Philadelphia. Um, so it was his idea, and he went to Mayor Rizzo at the time, it was in the 1970s, and uh, Rizzo loved the idea. A lot of uh, Philadelphians who tend to be conservative and don't necessarily embrace change um, were more skeptical about it but he pushed it through and since then the lights have changed they're now LED lights and um, they don't sparkle quite as much as the old ones do but uh, it's made a huge difference to our our landscape yeah. and but the good thing is that you could change the colors of the lights too so uh, yeah. when you celebrate uh, you know a special event the lights on Boathouse Row can coincide with whatever that special weekly or monthly celebration you know, is marking. Right? right. What do you hope that people get out of your book, Dottie, uh, Boathouse Row? I mean, uh, this is something that I know people that are Philadelphians will cherish because it is part of our history. Um, uh, spectators uh, that come to see a regatta, uh, participants, you know, competitors, they're going to want to pick up a copy of this book. Uh, visitors to the city. I mean, you've done a wonderful job here, but you know, for that person that's sitting in uh, in Fishtown or in South Philly or Chestnut Hill or out in the suburbs, what is it that you hope they take away from your book? So I want them to realize that Boathouse Row is not just a collection of pretty houses um, inhabited by elite rowers. That this is a place that is very much part of the landscape and the history of Philadelphia, and it's approachable. It's, you know, they can get involved if they want to. It's not just another thing out there. It's, it's part of their, the history of, of, their, of their town. Um, uh, the culture of the clubs reflects uh, a lot of the history of the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I just feel like there's a connection that needs to be made between the people of Philadelphia and these houses that are their houses. It's not like they're somebody else's houses. Sure, yeah. And uh, up until this point, no one has really tackled uh, this, uh, this topic, if you will. And as I said, you've done a wonderful job here. But uh, have there been uh, similar attempts or similar books, maybe not on the grand scale of this coffee table book, but have there been other, I mean, there have probably been numerous articles written about Boathouse Row, but has anybody else tackled this topic? Not, um, not in this way ever. Um, there have been, over time, uh, many 
shorter pieces written in different points. Uh, basically, each club has its own historian, I mm -hmm. should say. Mm -hmm. And each club has written pieces of their own history. So it's all been very siloed. Um, and there's some wonderful writings from like 1905, the 50th anniversary of one of the clubs. In, you know, a, a short essay was written sure. about the old days going skinny dipping in the, in the Schuylkill <laughs> under the moonlight, you know, going up to East Falls for um, uh, dinners of uh, mint juleps and catfish and waffles, apparently that was the thing. So there have been little pieces of it, but not anything that pulled it all the way through till today mm -hmm. with the breadth that, I, that I've attempted to do. Yeah. How, uh, how important was it to, for you to get the um, uh, the input of the, the different clubs? Were they cooperative to tell their story and share their histories? Yeah, well there are individuals in each club who are really wonderful at um, the more contemporary history because mm -hmm. they've lived it. Yeah. Uh, and then the clubs uh, have their minute books which are they've shared with me and, and old photographs. So there was a lot of sharing that went on and I owe a big debt to the clubs for their help in this. Well, you've done a wonderful job. Dottie Brown, Boathouse Row, Waves of Change in the Birthplace of American Rowing. Uh, you can pick up a copy of the book. Um, Dottie will also be signing copies of the book. Uh, uh, Head of the Schuylkill. Right at the end of the month. So uh, again, uh, pick up a copy of the book. You will be blown away in just learning about the history of this uh, iconic um, landmark in, in Philadelphia. And I want to thank Dottie for being with us here on this edition of the program. Until next time, thanks so much for being with us. My name is Paul Perello, and thanks for watching The Philly Factor.